Well, hey, Gabe, we got a really interesting episode today. I know it's it's going to be really fun. Uh, we've got Sarah Bogner on the on the show today, and Sarah is, I would consider an organization guru. She probably won't call herself that, but I'll call her that. <laughs> yeah, ab absolutely. Um, she she uh, she walked us through kind of her um, her personal organization approach, how how she developed it, and then how it how it's helped her, um, you know. Uh, obtain additional resources for her department and and uh, I think uh, climb the corporate ladder a little bit. Yeah, I I think that's something that I did not expect in this this uh, episode of the show is that there are so many benefits, and I knew this about personal uh, or personal benefits for organization, but also how do you even demonstrate the value of safety and what you're doing to others that might not be dialed into that that part of your of your work, uh, Sarah gets into the ideas of how do you select a system that will work for you, uh, the benefits of having a to-do list, and more importantly, the benefits of having a to-don't list, <laughs> which yeah. is fun. <laughs> yeah, which is hard for me. Um, but yeah, no, I and I again, I think that um, uh, people should listen in because it it's not just about being organized, but really demonstrating to your organization, how you can be proactive and strategic and, and a leader um, just, just by taking the time to plan out and, uh, and get organized. Absolutely. Uh, there, there's a lot to unpack in this episode, probably more than we're going to be able to cover in this time. Sarah touches on a lot of different topics, which is fantastic. And uh, hopefully we'll have some conversations with her again going forward. But this was a really fun one. Absolutely. Yeah, no, another uh, another exciting episode of Safeonomics. Um, I'm Scott Cuthbert, co-founder of Safeopedia. And I'm Gabe Incarnation, president of BBL Safety. And we have Sarah Bogner on the show with us today. This is this is very exciting. It's very cool. Thank you guys. Thanks for having me. I'm looking forward to chatting with you today. Awesome. Awesome. Well, Sarah, one of the things that we we've talked about on this uh, season of safeonomics is really just the the skills that are that a safety professional can can continue to develop and grow in that would help them really grow their careers and you know hopefully find some satisfaction in what they're doing with their work and and um, one of the things that that I've enjoyed in in our discussions together has been looking at the way you stay organized from a professional and personal basis and and um and thinking about just organization as a as kind of a superpower for safety professionals it is really important cuz generally you're you have way more tasks than you'll av be able to accomplish in a day absolutely so <laughs> you kind of have to prioritize right and make sure that it's it's working properly and and that you are hitting the right things at the right time and um so just give us kind of from a 50,000 foot view, what have you seen in your career with organization? How has it been done well? Uh, what are maybe some of the the things that you learned uh, from others or even just from your own personal experience that made you kind of rethink the way that organization works for you? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think safety has always been kind of an under-resourced uh, position. Everywhere I've worked, you've either been like the solo safety person, or even if you have a department, you've got limited resources, or your budget's really in someone else's department, or like you're taxed. And then also because we're kind of this like, typically kind of like this cousin to like operations and maintenance. Um, you're sitting in other people's staff meetings, and I don't know if this happened to you guys, but they see me as the safety person are like, oh, right, see, there's a safety issue I need to tell you about. And maybe we're in a budget meeting, but they're mentioning something about lockout tagout. Mm. So I'd write it on the agenda for the budget meeting, and then I'd get back to my office and be like, I had a note somewhere. What <laughs> meeting was I in when they were talking about lockout tagout? And so I've always been pretty organized, but in safety, like, it just is real easy to get out of control and lose those tasks and then I forget to follow up about lockout tagout and then maybe there's an incident or people aren't doing it properly or mm. they don't have enough locks or you know there's some real world consequences to losing those tasks and those asks to people um 
So I have always tried, I like paper planners. Uh, a lot of people don't like paper planners. I do. I will like them till the end of time. I, okay. <laughs> Gabe likes technology. <laughs> I use technology too. Um, and so I've always had some version of a paper planner and like the mm -hmm. little spiral day timers, but I don't know about you. I've bought planners and been like, this is going to change my life. This is going to fix everything. I have, it's pretty, it's the perfect size. It's got a cool cover. It's got, I go and fill in all the contact numbers and everything in it. You know, I use it for three days and like, everything's great. And then I just leave it on my desk one day and never look at it ever again. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yep. Okay. I've been there. Totally. Right. So this has been happening for years to me and I, I'd spend more and more money on planners and better planners and cuter planners and them looking cute is an important factor for me um and it wasn't working so what I did is um I used my uh safety investigation skills I kind of realized this is what I did after the fact but basically I did a root cause analysis why did certain planners work for me like did an apps too I tried all the apps um, why did this one, this list app work for me for some tasks, but not others? Why did I stop using it and went through all the ones that I had used in the past few years to try to figure out what I used about it, what I didn't like about it and why did I stop using it? Um, hmm. like I realized on paper planners, I never used like the monthly layout because I use Outlook for that. The long-term planning I tend to do on the computer, short-term day-to-day planning, I like to write out my to-do list. So hmm. I kind of went through this like parceled out um, pieces of to-do, because writing your to-do list is not one-time action, right? You've got right. long-term tasks, you've got meetings, you've got things I have to do today, you're like things I need to do eventually, and a way to have a dentist appointment. And if you have family stuff, like I pick up kids, I got to buy Halloween costume and you buy Halloween candy or sorry <laughs> whatever <laughs> holiday related stuff so how do you make that work for your current job and your current station in life and complications um so it's going to be a different outcome for everybody so for me hmm. I found I found a couple systems I kind of built out a system customized a couple things to make one that worked really great and it changed everything for me. Hmm. Um, I felt way more on top of my tasks. I combined it with a weekly workload planning. Um, so every Friday morning or Thursday night, I take my planners and I put stickers on them to make them pretty because I was also an art major at some point and they have to look, <laughs> they have to look nice also. So I do that Thursday night, Friday morning that I do, um, my weekly review, kind of a getting things done style of weekly review. And then I know what I absolutely have to get done that Friday to finish off the week. And then I can leave work at work Friday afternoon because I'm prepared for Monday before I go um, and really hold that time management sacred. Like that has to happen. Mm. Um, the weeks that if I miss it, I feel the impact. So so anyway, that was like my big kind of aha moment for me. And so now I, I like to try to help other people find their system that works for them because it's not going to be the same as my my crazy system. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. It doesn't seem that crazy, though. I mean, there, yeah. there's clearly a lot of thought behind it. Yeah. Yeah. So my work planner is like eight and a half by 11. So it's huge. But um I do that because then it fits agendas and I have, I work at a public utility, so we are very paper focused. And so it fits with all the paper. If I worked somewhere that was more, it did more stuff on Slack or Teams, um, then I probably would have less paper, more kind of online to-do lists. Mm. So, so it fits for my current job. If I switch to a different job, it might be a whole different uh, approach, I think. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So how, how many iterations did you have to go through before you found the one that worked worked for you just in case somebody's like yeah. tried two or three and it hasn't yeah worked. i mean before i really sat down and did the analysis like who knows how many a different one every year at least sometimes more you know halfway through the year i'd be like this is not working i'm going to home, uh, office depot and finding something new um but this the current version i use um actually is a disc bound system so hmm. uh it's 
sort of like ring, like a binder, um, but it allows you to take pages in and out. And so that was really helpful when I was trying to iter have different iterations because a page didn't work. I'd try something new. I found there's different planner companies that let you download like a sample page. I even made, like I hand drew one version of like, this is where I think I need the boxes and the layout and then scour the internet to find something <laughs> that would oh, fit it. Cool. So it kind of, it took a few months because I try any new thing for at least a week and I kind of used it as like, um, I did a thoughtful learning process to figure out at the end of the week, like, did this work? I'm like, no, I have post-it notes everywhere and I have things written on my hand. I used to be one of those people who write stuff on their hand. Like, okay, this is, this one does not work. Let's no. try something different. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but oh you always have your hand with you. So, you know. <laughs> oh, this is true. This is true. I mean, so, okay, let, let me look at it from even the employer standpoint. So um, for for someone that is, that has, let's say they're, they're, they're reporting to, to a manager and you, you're probably having your, your task list that you want done, like your, your air quotes job that you're, you're going to be doing. And then your manager generally will have their own tasks that they're going to be pushing down on you. Right. Yeah. So keeping those on hand and 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 prioritizing them well and planning them out well actually helps you to get the most important things done first um yeah. how have you seen even your efficiency and your ability to do your job well um improve as you've found that that organization method that works best for you yeah it's it's definitely helped a lot i feel much more in control of my own tasks or i we start off at my job we start off every monday with a management team meeting and so we'll get some direction there and then i can put it right into my to-do list you know like hey this has to be done this week or i have to tell my team about this thing or oh it's timesheet week we have to you know it's easier because it's all together in one system for me it's been easier to take that like notes from a meeting and put that into my to-do list um and my planner too i keep a reference section where i've got you know just phone numbers and holidays but then also like the strategic goals of the company um so someone wants to ask well, what should we prioritize oh i have them right here oh, so it's helped me be a better strategic leader to buying in you know showing that um demonstrating the company values and integrating those into the task because I have that stuff just really right at my fingertips. Um, so it's helped my own stress level, but I think it's helped me be a better kind of company team player too, because I mm. can more easily integrate other people's tasks and needs into my own stuff. Um, but yeah, figuring out like how that works with your brain and, you know, uh, Again, like this is a system that works for me. So how can you integrate that into how you think and how you want to get tasks done? It's like that critical kind of piece of that. Right. Yeah. I really like that concept too, of having that uh, almost like a guidepost that you're starting with what's important for the organization, because especially for your, your managers, let's say like that's going to be important for them too. Yeah. So having that understanding of, of that, that roadmap and being able to say, okay, well, this very closely aligns with what the organization's trying to do. So let's hit that first. And then these other things, yeah, they're great, but we'll, we'll get to them in a little bit. So that that's awesome. Yeah. And for safety, you know, we want to integrate into what other people do as much as possible and say like, Hey, the company, this is one of our goals for the year. Helping me with this safety thing helps you get towards those goals or this is in alignment with these goals and you have a hard time getting buy-in to put a guard on equipment or do new training or something if you can tie mm -hmm. it back to the overall company goals rather than just do this for me or do this for regulations you can say do this for the company and for you and for your bonus depending on who you're talking to uh that gets buy-in way easier as well because then it's for mm -hmm. the benefit of everybody so um it, you know it helps you getting out of being so siloed as a safety person, you know, more mm -hmm. in line with the business aspect um, by including that in there as well. So, yeah. Yeah. I was, I was going to ask about the prioritization and Gabe, Gabe touched on it a little bit, but <clears throat> you know, in, in, in my, my mind, you know, for, for me, there's always kind of the four quadrants, right. Of like, what's going to have the the biggest impact and what's going to be the most effort and, and, and where, do, where does it fall? Um, you know, so that you can, um, ho hopefully you don't just chase, 
you know, who, the last thing somebody asks you to do <laughs> becomes your, right. your first priority. But how do you how do you do like when as you're planning, how do you go through and sort of evaluate um, the level of importance and and the significance over other tasks? Because like you mentioned at the beginning, we're often uh, after often overwhelmed with more more tasks than we can possibly uh, possibly get done in a day. Yeah, you know, firefighting has been, yeah, a large part of my career. You're just <laughs> doing the thing, the hazard in front of you. And so for me, when I do the planning, at least the week to week plan, the week on the Friday before, I can plan out my, like, I need, I have to schedule time this next week to update the fall protection program or some more programmatic stuff. Like, that's always the first program for me. Program updates are always the first thing to fall off. Because, like, who reads the written program? Well, probably just me. So, you know, it impacts how you implement it. But, you know, the the documentation of the program, for me, usually falls lower on the priority list than, like, going out and fixing a problem. Um, so planning had been, like, I ha making, scheduling some blocks in my calendar for, like, you have to spend time doing this um, is helpful. And I do annual planning with my little team um, just to figure out even just like a low bar of like, hey, what are the like top three, top five programs we have to work on this year? We have to get done. And then new stuff always comes up, but keeping in mind so at our weekly team meeting, it's always like, hey, who's like, let's say fall protection. Who's doing what on fall protection this week and trying to break it down into small chunks, manageable chunks. Like I have to update the whole 30 page program. No, today I am investigating ladder climb devices and making sure that seeing what technology is out there or then maybe the next week I'm going doing job site visits to look at the ladder climbing devices that we have but trying to break down into those little tiny tasks that I could hopefully integrate into something else so if I get pulled aside I have to go look at ex an excavation oh wait there's a uh, I was sorry I work at a public water utility so there's a water tank nearby that has that ladder climbing device I need to look at I'm going to do both in one job site visit mm. and so you know try to um, I try to break those down as small as possible so if I do get hijacked by something that's going on I can still hopefully you know sneak it in there somehow um, but taking that time to plan uh, you know that Friday time really is helpful so do you plan some margin in there too? Because I, I think that's kind of what I was I was looking at as well, where I, I know for me, I get interrupted a lot in my work and I, it's very rare that I can lock in for, let's say, an hour and just work on one task. That just doesn't happen. So how do you factor that into your planning so that you can actually, you know, actually get some work done, but not feel frustrated if you have some interruptions that happen? I could be better at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's a learning experience. I'm it's saying cool. this like I haven't figured it out. No, it's right. the goal. So that's why I say our goal is to update like three to five programs a year. But I have 40, 40 to 50 programs, environmental health and safety that we manage at my agency. So I should be updating more than three to five in a year. So that is my kind of low bar. Um 10 would be better. So I'm getting through them every five years. And we usually get more, but it's usually because something new comes up, you know, that like, oh, wait, now we're working on, there's new silica regulations. So now we're working on silica. Okay. Well, that will count as one of our ones for the year. So I guess there's buffer in that way where mm. if I want to update 10 programs in a year, I'm picking three to five that for sure we're doing and the others will come to us. Um, and then if we get to the end of the year and we only did eight, but we were really responsive, you know, I think that's fine with me. And I have some uh, flexibility where I work, where that's okay. Um, not every place is like that, but I try to set realistic -ish goals, but sometimes, you know, like the COVID years, I only did COVID response for like a year and a half full time. Mm. So none of that got done and you just have to push it out. So I think just, you know, sometimes you just have to cancel it, you know, you can't, uh, I, I kept, I would keep writing out on my weekly to-do list, like work on fall protection work on so and finally I was like look I'm never gonna get it's been 25 <laughs> weeks it's been on there so <laughs> we're just not gonna do it you just um, keep changing the date and <laughs> pushing it forward <laughs> yeah. um but I'm still working on that part that's hard because we still are a response you know prof profession generally right yeah I was I was gonna ask as well because in in talking to you know 
safety professionals over the last few years uh, in particular, and, and you touched on like the solo safety uh, person, um, the, a lot of times the their plate sort of the default plate. <laughs> oh, we need somebody to deal with uh, property insurance. Oh, we need somebody, you know, and, and a lot of things, um, maybe because the organizations don't fully understand how full the plate is already. Um, yeah. So how do you... How has this helped you, you know, communicate, um, you know, with with uh, senior management or even laterally with other departments when when your plate is full um, and, and you just can't take something on or you just can't reasonably get it done in, in the time frame they're asking? Yeah. So when I I've been at this agency for nine years and when I started, my predecessor had a similar problem. And, you know, I think it's common where in safety, we're, we only come out of our little corner when something bad happens. You know, we have no visibility, right? It just, uh, oh, Sarah popped up. That must mean something bad happened. She's going to lecture us and then go back to her little dark corner. <laughs> <laughs> Make a so, guest appearance. <laughs> yeah, like, uh oh, the safety person showed up. You know, you don't want that kind of reaction. So, right. For me, the first part was visibility of not just complaining, like I have too much work, I have so much work, this is overwhelming, I need people, which may all be true, but explaining to my leadership, um, like, hey, I am really busy or I can't, I'm taking forever to update this program because I'm spending all this time hand-holding this one group or I'm researching this PP or you gave me insurance and I have to learn how to be an expert in that and for those of us yeah. that are like generalists we have to learn a new thing to be an expert at like every week practically it seems like so and that takes time so you know um showing my non-safety you know I'm I was the only I was the solo safety pro person when I started at this agency and so just explaining to non-safety people what it means and tracking my time with a planner it also helped being like, look, see, look, I spent four hours trying to figure this out, mm. or I tried to, I spent four hours, but I was interrupted constantly. So it really would have only taken me an hour, but I had to answer questions that should have already been answered before, you know, like, Hey, this, you know, once a year, the same question comes up and I have to re research it. So, <laughs> um, the visibility was really helpful for me. So, explaining workload, explaining the details, the technical details of what I was working on, showing other people in my agency that like safety is a profession. It's not just <laughs> like OSHA, you know, we have peer reviewed things and there's research and best practices and really opening up, pulling back that window, that veil um, of what our profession is. And ex I work primarily for engineers. So explaining it in engineering language, um, was helpful for me. So when I did say, Hey, I'm really overwhelmed. They had a concept of what that meant. Mm. Um, and then I was able later to actually get more staff. I now have a staff, I have a team of four. I was one and a public agency, especially water utilities. That's really hard to get extra staff. <laughs> and that was because of the visibility and really trying to integrate as much as possible with other people. So, um, as much as I could say, hey, you're already going out to that site. Can you look at that ladder for me and take pictures? And here's like two things I need you to measure. You know, not like don't give them 45 asks, but give them one or two asks to help um, to try to integrate it, what I do into what other people do. It helps with my workload, but then it helps cue people into what my workload is even. Um, like, hey, you need to be able, you know, when I go monitor, do asbestos sampling, take someone from the field with me so they can see, hey, when you ask for this, this is what it involves. And this is how long it takes and the equipment we use. Um, and so they have a better concept of what they're asking. Just, hey, just do insurance. You know, uh, that's, <laughs> <laughs> that's not always an easy ask or just sample this whole facility for lead paint. And there's, you know, I'm going to have to take 85 samples. What does that look like? Mm -hmm. Um you know, that was really helpful to have that visibility because explaining what the heck we do. Cause I feel like a lot of people outside safety don't have any idea. <laughs> That's funny. That's something that I did not anticipate with this whole idea of, of being organized and planning uh, for the safety professional is that you're actually able to demonstrate the value and the worth 
of of what the safety professional does to other people that may not be directly involved in safety. So whether that's upper management or your peers, being able to show them you know, based on a calendar, hey, here's what I did all day, or here's what I was able to accomplish, um, or in some cases, what I was not able to accomplish uh, because of all the other things that needed to be done. That's kind of cool. I, that That's something that I had not anticipated um, as kind of a, a neat byproduct of, of essentially tracking all of your tasks and being able to show someone this is this is what you do. Um, yeah, the other part that I that I figured out too, as you said it, which is a, a minor pet peeve of mine, is the moment someone uses the word "just" in front of a task, it basically tells me, "Oh, I don't think you really understand what goes into this." So, just filling out that log or just going to a meeting or those kind of things, it's it's not that easy. It's <laughs> so never just. It's, it's never, never. It's never that simple. Yeah. Never is that simple. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And the not done list was helpful too. When I was prioritizing, I would say like, hey, here's my plan for the next week, or here's the programs I want to do. Here's the ones I'm not doing. I am choosing mm. to not do it. And then I'd ask my supervisor who is not in safety, do you agree with my prioritization? So like, do you agree that I'm not going to do these five things? Like things might not be compliant on the schedule that you want, unless you can give me more resources and then we can do it all, you know? So, <laughs> and I didn't ask for that the first time, but like try to get used to like, if you're overwhelming your safety person, you, there's things that aren't getting done. There's compliance risks. Um, there's vulnerabilities there that are not necessarily, they might be benign or really unlikely, um, but they might not be. And so being aware of the choices, you know, if you're not giving safety people enough resources, here's, and, and really matter of fact turns, like here's a potential result, not, um, you know, how dare you, you don't care about our employees' lives. I mean, you can take that approach as well, but that's not always going to be as successful because then people start to get defensive where it's just like, here's what I'm doing. Here's what I'm not doing. Do you agree? Um, and some bosses are just going to say, well, do it all. I don't care, but <laughs> hopefully you can ease them in, you know, it depends <laughs> on your bosses. But <laughs> Yeah. I, and I mean, you, you kind of answered my question before, before I asked, because a lot of people that, um, you know, we hear you know how do i get ahead in in my organization and and how and how do i get ex, extra help right so i think you you're an example of of somebody who did both of those things as as a byproduct of being proactive and and planful and so you you kind of touched on the you know here's here's what i can do and here's what i can't do what how do you want how do you want us to approach this and and uh, from an extra resource perspective, and and then um, you know maybe you can elaborate a little bit on how the organization you know changed its view or grew its view on on you and your leadership skills by by uh, being able to articulate those uh, resource kind of pinches within the organization. Yeah, so it took eight years to build a team, so hmm. it's slow. But again, public service. Some of the, it depends who I'm talking to about this. If I'm talking to other public service people, they're like, oh man, that's so fast. And then private industry, you're like, <laughs> what? That's crazy. So I think it was still, you know, appropriately time for our agency. But um, so I started just me. I had some admin support, like in another building, if I really needed it, was kind of the term, which doesn't, isn't real support, but um <laughs> <laughs> they were, we were I trying. need it all the time. Yeah, <laughs> they need to be assigned to you. They need to have like that as part of their job expectations. Um, but fine, I'll take what I can get. Started using them a lot. Um, I knew I had enough for a full time admin person. Hmm. Um, but again, I was new. There's this push. We're really working on improving safety culture. So I had some political capital. And then one of our other managers was talking about how he needed an admin person. He'd been here forever had more political capital. And so we worked together and actually developed, got an admin position that we shared 50, 50. Um, I, she sat, uh, the person sat outside his office to, so I give him a little boost. Um, but my work was, uh, more fun and more interesting and I had more of it. So slowly started, you know, 55% of the day, 55% of the work, 60% of the work started taking <laughs> over their time more and more. Um, until I was able to actually transfer her over to me full time. Hmm. 
but again, still tracking my work saying she's doing all this great admin work. Look how great we made a huge impact on our safety training program, getting people to actually go to the training they needed to do, bring in some outside really quality instructors. So I wasn't spending all my time teaching. So that's freed up hmm. my time to do other things. Um, and like, look, this little bit is working great. We can get better if we have her more. Um so that happened, and then um, I had we had another opportunity where we weren't adding headcount, but we had interns, and uh, our interns were classified as like a quarter of an employee, and so we were reclassifying them so they didn't count on our employee headcount, and so we had a free FTE full time employee like equivalent. We had like a person, and the agent everyone at agency is like, oh my gosh, I want this person, I want this, I want this person to work for me. But I had done all this work over the past few years showing how under-resourced I was. We were do making great strides. We'd reduced injuries. So I was already having success. And so I said, look, I think I should get it. And I had supportive management already because I had built up for like the last, for like four or five years, showing them why it mattered, why we needed this person. Um, and so I got the position I won. It was great. Nice. <laughs> yeah. Um, <laughs> And then I had to like work with uh, our maintenance staff to actually find office space for them because we're short space. So I had to move other people. And so I had to have really good relationships with field staff to get a physical place for them as well. Hmm. Um, and so we had our little team of three, but um, we also have an environmental. So I did health and safety. We have an environmental compliance officer in our agency as well. He started about a year after I did, and he was in a different department than me even though EHNS is like a thing, right? But my agency did not know that was a thing. So we had for many years started integrating each other's work. Like we started covering for vacation for each other, started putting out memos together, started doing all of these little kind of behind the scenes brainwashing to show people that EHNS belonged together. He also didn't have admin support. Um, so then I, uh, last year, uh, wrote a memo to his boss saying, as of, you know, 30 days from now, uh, if, unless you have a concern, he works for me. And uh, no one had a concern. So <laughs> he works for me <laughs> <Nice>. now, <laughs> which is great. Uh, so now we have this team of four, uh, the specialists we hired. We thought we're thinking ahead because he's been working here a few years. Instead of just being a safety specialist, he's an environmental health and safety specialist, so mm. EHNS. So you can support both me or the environmental compliance officer. Same with our admin support. So we're trying to think ahead, and that creates a promotion chain too. So I have admin to specialist to environmental compliance officer to the manager in my position. Um, so we're I'm trying to think long term strategically, and that gets buy in from. The unions that gets buy-in from HR, that gets buy-in from management, because thinking more holistically, not just about like, oh my gosh, I need a person right now. Right. But right. I'm building this sustainable group of people that has um, room to grow. Uh, so we finally, uh, as of July 1st, four people, we have our own budget, we have our own truck, we have our own <laughs> office. <laughs> nice. Great. I couldn't ask for more, but again, it took eight years, and yeah. it was not the path that we... Uh, envisioned initially you know we had like the intern thing and trying to like work with other people and so you have to find those little windows where you can work with the system of bureaucracy you're in instead of against it um, especially right. in public service but anywhere you work you know you can't just do it you can't just bulldoze people right right so that's the coolest thing too in, in that that process that you're talking about where where it's you understood kind of the rules of the game right of of how the organization works and what's important to people in that in that game. And so even having that level of organization of what you need to do and having it in line with what other people need to do and what they're able to do, um, I think it makes sense that that, yeah, it, it's gonna take some time and it's gonna take some effort. But if you have that perspective of here's what I want to get accomplished and here's how I get to translate that to others that are you know, either they're in control of those resources or they can help you find those resources. I think that's that's phenomenal. And if you're not organized as a person, as a safety professional, as a professional in general, it's really easy to get caught up in those whirlwinds that we get hit by all the time, right? It's it's yeah. those those things that are the fire drills and they go crazy and then you lose sight of what you're actually supposed to be doing. Yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah, I was going to ask um, a little outside of the organizing and planning and and uh, being strategic in your approach. Is you you started you touched on it the safety and environmental uh, split within your agency and you you started out on the, more on the environmental side, correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I then, did. So maybe a little bit of background about about how you got started and then how you ended up on the on the safety side of the uh, of the EHS equation. <laughs> yeah, so I went to school for environmental science. Um, and I thought I was going to go, yeah, hug trees and save, save the marshes and all that great stuff. Um, and, um, then I got, I needed a, a job on campus and there was a place called the environmental safety office at work and it had the word environment in it. And so did my major. So that sounded like it would re look really good on my resume. So <laughs> I started working there and then started learning a little bit more about safety. I um, actually went to a 40 hour HazWopper class, um, just like the basic HazMat class week long and was totally hooked. It was so cool. <laughs> uh, it was, you know, you're helping people and you're responding to emergencies and you get to use technology and PP cool equipment. And um, it was really neat. So um, after college, I applied for environmental jobs, applied for safety jobs. I got a safety job first, um, but actually was doing EHS, environmental health and safety, doing all the permitting. I worked in automotive, uh, automotive supplier manufacturer and um, did all the environmental compliance, did ergonomics, um, did safety. And the safety part was where I really kind of found my jam. You know, I like the people side of it a lot. Mm. Um, and I think that's why a lot of us get into safety. We like protecting people, helping people. A lot of us are helpers. Um, but it's, you know, um, and then it was just from there. I got went to water utilities. I've been in safety and water utilities ever since, um, But which I love. I loved every minute of it. Well, most minutes of it. But um, <laughs> it's, uh, but yeah, there's still that firefighting and all of that. And so bringing the environmental back under my radar is really nice kind of full circle moment. Um, it's been really great to put those things together because there's a lot of overlap between those groups. Mm. Um, and so I was glad I was able to bring that efficiency back. Um, and so I think that's how that planning, organizing stuff, you know, really is effective is if you're also thinking about how it helps the organization, not just yourself. But hmm. um, I mean, the stickers on my planner are for me, not for my organization. <laughs> <laughs> it's got to look good, yeah. right? Oh, yeah, it's got to be pretty. It's got to be pretty. <laughs> so I want to touch. Uh, oh, go ahead, Scott. Oh, go no, I, I, it was it's a little, little bit random. But just I remember or as you were describing your process of finding the right uh, scheduler, I, I when I first started working, I remember I I think it was a colleague he had it was a like a, a mail order day timer it was the, the the coil bindings and you could order the different sheets and and uh i i remember uh yeah like finding the finding the formats that worked well for me and then you order you know a hundred of those pages and you forget about the you know the monthly view or the whatever view, like you say <laughs> it doesn't doesn't work for you and it is it is uh they're they're uh not as not as popular probably anymore but yeah have being able to um swap out pages for me was uh was important i have a i have a little uh, uh you know it's more of the forward looking um one and it's got the it's got the <clears throat> the weekly uh daily weekly monthly sort of view but it it I wish it was all of those pages. Every page was that page because yeah. <laughs> that's the only. It's like there's a bunch of blank pages, and then there's that page full of full of my. I notes, have a planner so. recommendation for you. I'll yeah. send it oh, over here we go. Yeah, so. <laughs> nice. Well, that, that, it's funny that Scott. That was actually pretty related to what I was going to ask too. To to circle back to the very start of the conversation, uh, Sarah, you mentioned a few times this is a system that you've developed that works well for you. Mm -hmm. And other people need to find the system that works well for them as well. So, you know, as we're looking at, at the next few minutes of just you know, wrapping up a conversation, what are some of the ways that someone can start to look at this kind of myriad of, of options for them 
and start figuring out how do you pare that down to even a few options that you can try out, as you said, for like a week at a time and then dial in and see how that would work best for you. What are some ways to even start if you're just looking at your outlook? If, if your outlook inbox is anything like mine, it is an absolute disaster. There's hundreds, if not thousands of unread messages. Oof, and boy. like, what do you do? I, I'm not a zero inbox sort of person. It's just, no, I've given either. up on that. Uh, absolutely given up. So how do you take that kind of rat's nest of stuff and figure out what's going to work best for you. Yeah. So yeah, like for me, I said, try to figure out what I've already tried and get some insight on what worked or not. Like for my daily and weekly to-do list, if I don't physically write it down, like have the muscle memory of writing it down, it does not Mm. stick in my head. So I tried going all digital and I just felt more unsettled more like unease I'd have a minute and be like what am I supposed to be doing (laughs) so if you've ever done something where you feel you know the feeling is matters so for me Mm -hmm. I knew so I knew I needed for shorter term planning I need to be able to write it down um but longer term planning like a monthly view meeting even my meeting schedule that's all outlook because that's what we use at work and that's kind of how the world works do I, I rewrite them on my planner for the day um so then I always have it with me um so yeah looking back and thinking what helps you feel on top of your day like I'm not inbox zero I will never be so I just let it go like I deal with messages as I need to but that is not a priority for me to feel effective um So trying to find little nuggets of like, what's going to work? And then for me, separating out to-do list items from both personal and work, Mm. from appointments, from strategic planning, and looking at those all separately, because there may be one system that works. Um, One of my coworkers uses Outlook tasks, and she uses Outlook for everything. Their whole, everything is an Outlook. One system works for her great. Beautiful. I wish I was like that. Seems really nice and simple. (laughs) But I'm not. So figuring out what needs to live where, both with strategic work and then pick one thing. Like for me, it was really my day, my to do's. So when people come up and say, hey, I need to talk to you about lockout tag out, where am I going to write that down where I will remember again? Um, and then working in that plant, that weekly check in. And so when I was doing different iterations, I really used it as an experiment. Like, okay, this week might suck. This week might be great. Uh, <laughs> we'll see where we are on Friday. Like, it might be a disaster. And so, and I would warn, like, the other people I work with, like, I'm trying a new system. My admin would just roll her eyes. Like, oh, no, <laughs> They're all <great."> terrified. <laughs> <laughs> so you're going to have to pick up the slack if I am late to every single meeting this week. And so then Friday, I can kind of check in and be like, okay, was that a crazy like did I how unsettled was I this week less unsettled than the system I used last week or is it better and you know kind of um picking away at the different parts of it um so to be patient with it Mm -hmm. and then it will change uh so like I um my personal uh system um is totally different than my work one um and that's been great and when I leave my work system at work and my personal stuff at home um but my needs are really different and some people want to integrate that. Some people want them separate. So even figuring that out, like, do I need one system that works for everything or do I want two separate systems that don't speak to each other or something in between? Mm-hmm. Um, so, so yeah, just taking little bits at a time is usually the most help has been the most helpful thing. Um, and then if you have an idea of like, this is the kind of system I want, uh, ask me because I probably know about all of them because I'm a nerd <laughs> for all that stuff. Yeah. <laughs> I can give you a recommendation. <laughs> awesome. We'll, we'll definitely uh, include your coordinates uh, in the in the description so people can uh, can reach out and uh, geek out about uh, getting yeah. getting organized because I think this would be, you know, a pretty cool movement to uh to get everybody in in safety organized and feeling empowered like like you feel um you know with with your schedule with your destiny and and with with your organization as well right like you're Absolutely. not uh, you're not leaving it up to chance and you're it's it's uh, it, it, uh you know coming from the construction industry they'll plan a job for 4 years before they break ground and 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 often when we're uh, when we're desk jockeys, we we just think that we have to do instead of instead of plan. So um, mm-hmm. yeah, definitely yeah, a, a good good takeaway. 
I think what I really like about that whole planning perspective, first of all, is it kind of helps you keep your sanity, especially as a as a solo safety professional. Uh, but on top of that, I think you it allows you to really have some data driven um, evidence to to back up the agendas that you're trying to move forward, right? So if you're like you said in your case, if you are looking to get an admin or get additional resources or to be able to have your to don't list, yeah. it's not that you're, you don't want to do the work. You would really love to. It's just, you're limited on time and resources. So you're, you're actually building visibility for others to be able to see, Hey, this is what, what I'm able to do. Here's what I could do more of if I have more resources and ultimately, you are translating that need for for safety and the, the needs of the safety department mm -hmm. to others that that might not know exactly what's needed in those areas. So just being able to even pick a planner that works well or a system mm -hmm. that works well, I, it, it's it's so wild to me because it's like it seems like such a small a small thing, but the benefits of it could be really massive, both on the personal, professional, and um, the organizational standpoints. I think it's really cool. Absolutely. No, it seems trivial, but in the long run, it's not. And even helps you own if you want to leave. It leaves your department in a better place for someone else to take up and mm -hmm. allows you to better assess future jobs because you know what your work, um, you know, really looked like here. How many programs are you managing? How many could you get done? And if you're looking at a, assessing a new job you're going to, it's easier to kind of pick it apart as well. Yeah. That's really neat. I, I, and I, I think we'll we'll do a poll, um, you know, maybe following this uh, episode about who who's a zero inbox person and who isn't. Because, and I'm I'm not a zero <laughs> inbox, but I'm like I can't have more than twenty five email in there, or it starts to give me. Oh my gosh! I'm, I'm like uh, two hundred unnecessary limit, yeah. stress and anxiety. But what what I <laughs> what I discovered um, with with Gmail, anyways, was the snooze option. And and so, in order to get comfortable with my email list, I can I can pick a snooze date, you know, for for an email, so it's not there until I've I've prioritized it. And if I hit if I snooze it more than you know two or three times, then I know it's it's not important, and I can I can that's great I can delete it or move it out of my inbox. But uh, yeah. but it's somebody I work with. I won't name who that person <laughs> is, but I, I think they have a hundred thousand emails in their inbox and and they just they use the tagging and you know other other oh uh, methods to to organize but when i when i see that it just uh it just stresses me out yeah <laughs> i, I could not it. i'd freak out i'd just turn the computer off <laughs> i'm so tempted i'm so tempted that at the end of this year so this is what october of almost november of 2024 when we're recording this but i'm so tempted in the next couple of months when the year is out to just select all and then mark as red and just start the new year with <laughs> no unread emails in my inbox. <laughs> I tried that once as one of my, I would just move everything into a folder. Yeah. And then it will come back up if it, if it's really important. Well, some of it didn't. So it wasn't the best method, but it felt really good for like a week until it just it happened again. I'm a, little, <laughs> I'm a little terrified. I, I, I have not, I have not clicked that button because I, I'm afraid of what will happen. <laughs> afterwards <laughs> but I, i'm good with organizing my inbox but i'm i'm really bad at the do not do list i i have trouble mm. i have trouble putting things on that on that list so i i that's definitely something i can take <laughs> away and, and work on yeah it's hard it's really hard but it it's helpful to actually make that active choice rather than just getting forgotten mm. yeah. that's yeah. true at least for that's me true I could see how that would be extremely beneficial. And um, Sarah, thanks so much for sharing your your time and your expertise with us. And it, it's one of those things, I, I well, organization is one of those things, I think, that it sounds simple. And then when you actually start doing it, it gets a little bit more difficult. And then I think something that you really touched on well is that uh, it it is different for everybody, that the way that you process information, the way that you... Uh, want your planner to look also and and how it makes you feel as you're working on it and the value you can bring to your organization. I think that's it's a very unique thing. Um, and it's something that definitely um, I hope our audience takes to heart 
and is able to to see that that hey the the important part is having a system is being organized uh, however you way you want to do it please go through that exercise and uh, and figure it out but it's it's way better to have a system than to not for sure agreed <laughs> and and Sarah's new side hustle is making custom organizers for people. <laughs> there you go. I'll with, give you with, recommendations. With I have fancy, yeah. fancy decorations and stickers. Stickers. Lots of stickers. Yeah. Stickers for everyone. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Great. Yeah, well, thank you so much for joining us today, Sarah. Thank you very much. This is great. This is a fun time.